So I actually did my PhD in Cape Town, so it was very familiar territory for me. And I spent the last few years doing postdoc at UCL, where I did most of this work. And now I'm back, for good, as good as it gets, uh, with the resident researcher position joint between AIMS and SKA. So for those of you from Cape Town, you'll be seeing a lot more of me. Now, I was looking at the talks uh, that had the title for the talk for the conference. And if I could define some kind of arbitrary parameter space of talks, I think mine is going to be a bit of an outlier. So hopefully that just means it's extra interesting. Uh, right, so I'm going to be, uh, I'm not a theorist, I'm a sheep and wolf's clothing here today. I actually kind of walk the line between theory and data. I do a lot of statistics, I do a lot of machine learning, basically developing the techniques in order to connect your theories to observers' data. And I'm going to be talking about one particular problem with uh, actually doing that, a particular problem that we need a technique that can solve. So if you're interested, there's a paper if you want to read more about this work. And also, if you're more generally interested in machine learning, hopefully this kind of gives you a feel for how you approach a machine learning problem. Before I do that, though, I want to kind of try and convince you why supernova matter. Hopefully you don't need too much convincing, given uh, how much of an impact supernovae have had on the field of uh, cosmology, and particularly dark energy. So I'm working as part of a project called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. So this is something being built in Chile, and uh, it's going to be taking data around 2020. And this thing is a monster. This is an absolutely revolutionary machine. We're going to observe most of the southern, almost the entire southern sky uh, over a period of 10 years with uh, incredible resolution, incredible sensitivity, and also uh, with very quite high cadence. So by the end of the 10 years, we're expecting LSC is going to detect millions of transients. It's something like 10 million transients a night. Right? A lot of them are the same transients, but still, this is a massive amount of data. And we expect by the end of it, we'll have about 100,000, of the order of 100,000, well-characterized supernova. So somewhere between 100,000 and a million. Now, to give you an idea, the current state-of-the-art supernova sample, the JLA, is about 750. So this is a couple orders of magnitude more than where we are right now. So this is quite an exciting data set that we'll get out of LSST. Why do we care? Well, obviously supernovae are an amazing probe of dark energy. And uh, so I found this quite impressive from the LSST science book. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the W not WA parameterization, but everyone uses it, so we can stick to it. Now, these are constraints that you get from using supernovae as our normal cosmological probes, and also doing BAO just with supernovae, which is quite interesting. And this is something no one's ever been able to do, we just haven't had the numbers. So you can get constraints purely from supernova alone on dynamical dark energy. And now you start adding things like the blending, galaxy clusters, CMB, and these constraints just get better. One thing I find really interesting for LSST, and also that's never been done, is because we'll have supernovae over the entire southern sky, we can start doing quite interesting tests. So normally what happens is supernovae are focused on small fields of view, often called deep drilling fields. And uh, so you get a whole lot of supernovae in this very small field, and they do geocosmology. But for the first time, we're going to have supernovae across the whole sky. So you can start doing interesting things like saying, well, do we get a different value for W in this direction versus this direction? You can start testing an inhomogeneity. And you can start measuring the local inhomogeneity of the universe. And uh, I know at this conference there's a few talks on inhomogeneous cosmology, so hopefully this will be of particular interest. So this is why I think LSST is amazing and why we're actually interested in supernova with it. So, there's a problem. Only one problem. No, there's plenty of problems, but this is, this is one that we uh, decided to work on. As you will know from Cosmology 101, there are several types of supernova. There's a type that we really like as cosmologists. That's our type 1A. We think that uh, these are always binary stars. White dwarf either creates a matter from a standard star like this, or a couple of white dwarfs emerging. So what happens is they reach a specific mass limit, the Chandrasekhar limit, explode, and because they always explode at the same mass limit, the idea is that they explode 
the same breakfast. And there's caveats to that, but this is more or less true. And what that means is that you can get beautiful Hubble diagrams like this. This is a little bit outdated now, but uh, this is various data sets um, going out to quite high redshift, measuring the expansion history of the universe. I will point out OSST is going to be able to fill in some of these gaps at high redshift, which is great. The problem is these aren't the only types of supernova there are. There are also core collapse. And uh, what happens here is that a massive star just runs out of fuel and eventually implodes. Now, of course, that can happen at any mass limit. So these are not good standard candles. Can, these can explode at pretty much any brightness. And uh, that means for cosmologists, these are just contaminants. These are bad guys. We don't want them on the same. The reason is that if you assume that they were standard candles, they'll tend to sit above the true uh, expansion line here and bias your cosmology. So these are really bad. We want, don't want them in the data center. Of course, there are people who like core collapse supernova who are studying them. They're really interesting test beds of high energy physics. And so uh, LSST is going to be great for this as well. So what we wanted to do is to be able to distinguish between these types because cosmologists want these ones and uh, people studying supernova care about these ones. Okay, so this is our goal. We want to make as much use of the LSST data as, uh, data set as possible. Because the problem is that it's actually quite hard to distinguish between these two types, right? Traditionally, the only way to do it is by taking a spectrum. That's how we've classified supernova in the past. We've classified it based on the spectrum. So you see a bright object, think it's a supernova, you follow it up, do spectroscopy, and decide is it a 1A or is it a non-1A. Now the problem is taking spectra is extremely time consuming, it's very expensive, and so the reality is for LSST, I'd be surprised if even 5% of the data set was followed up. So that means you've got you know, thousands of supernova that you would just throw away because you can't tell the difference between the types. So with the standard way we've been doing supernova cosmology, we'd end up throwing away 95% of the data set, which is obviously not what we want to do. So the trick is, we need to figure out how to classify supernovae based on the photometry alone. So we've got, no spe well, we've got very little spectroscopy, we will have some, but uh, we have very little training spectroscopy, and so we're going to have to figure out how to classify them based on their light curves. Ultimately, what we want to do is produce a probability of belonging to different types, because there are very nice Bayesian statistics approaches that can uh, give you unbiased results by using these probabilities. And one of the interesting things we started working on is the LSST observing strategy. If you start actually reading about what LSST is trying to do, it's really crazy. They, they're trying to do all science with one instrument with one survey, essentially. They want to study near-Earth objects, they want to study the Milky Way, they want to study the lensing. You know, there's, there's a huge range of science with one machine. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, what observing strategy do we need to do in order to be able to do all the science? That means things like how often do you return to a particular patch of sky, how often do you change filters, really practical hands-on stuff like this that hasn't been determined yet. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to push for good cosmology with LSST. We specifically want to good, push for good supernova cosmology. And we don't understand how things, changes in observing strategy are going to affect uh, the classification. So one of the things that we want to study is uh, this exact thing about observing strategy. I'm very briefly going to insult your intelligence by uh, going through supernova science, which you probably also remember from Cosmology 101, but just as a reminder. Uh, so again, this is a picture of what we think 1As look like. Now, when I said that they're standard candles and they all explode at the same brightness so we know how far away they are, I was kind of lying to you. They're actually standardizable candles. So if you plotted light curves, so this is a light curve for supernova, brightness is a function of time. So it explodes, it gets very bright, and then you get radioactive decay, and it eventually fades away over a period of you know, several weeks. Now if you plot a bunch of light curves from a bunch of 1As, they look like this. You can see they're similar, but they're not the same. They're lying on top of each other. So you kind of have to apply a bit of a fudge factor. 
in order to get them to line up. So there's this very famous Phillips stretch correction, which is actually a very simple correction that you apply, <coughs> just that the length of time that the supernova, uh, the, the light curve is, the length of the light curve is proportional to how bright it is, or how the luminosity here. And so you can apply the stretch correction and get them to line up nicely on top of the top. So uh, one of the you know, the things that people say is embarrassing about supernova cosmology. The cosmologists don't care. We're quite happy to do this empirically. It works beautifully. We've uh, calibrated these things based on nearby distance measures. So we're pretty confident that this works. But the reality is we don't know why. We don't know why these, there's this variation. We don't really know what these progenitors are. There's a lot of actual astrophysics in here that we don't know about. And it's actually remarkable we've been able to get so far with so little scatter without knowing these things. But the problem is that we're getting to the point where we're systematics limited. That LSST will be systematics limited for sure. We'll have so many supernovae we will have driven down the statistical noise, but now we have to deal with these kind of systematics. So a really important thing is to try and figure out the physics work on here. Anyway, it's not really my problem, it's astrophysics problem. So the point is that once you've applied the stretch correction, and I'll show you a bit later the actual equation that you use, you end up with this very nice Hubble diagram that I showed you. And you can start testing things like how much dark energy there is, you can start testing things like is it dynamical, etc. etc. We all know how great supernovae are for this. So what does the actual data look like, the photometric data? So you have when you have a when you do photometry, like LSST, like SDSS, like DES, you've heard all these surveys. When you do photometry, you always have several filters. Right? So in the case of LSST, we'll have six filters. And you'll take measurements in any particular filter band. Here's, for example, SNLS. These are the standard GRIZ filters. And what you see is that the light curve looks different in different colors. And now, this is the thing that we actually leverage in order to be able to do classification. So here's a kind of cartoon of it. Say you picked one of these filters, and you looked at three different types of supernova in this filter. You can see there are slight differences in the shape of the light curve in the different filters. The problem is that if you asked an expert in supernova, you gave them a bunch of light curves, and said, tell me which one is a 1A, which one is a type 2, they probably won't be able to tell you. These differences are very subtle and very difficult to quantify. So this is why machine learning is a great solution for this kind of problem. Any questions on supernova basics? Yes. I do. <coughs> so, how many filters would you need in order to interpret it between photometry and spectroscopy? That's a good question. So, quite a lot of work has been done on this. And in fact, I'll show you the standard equation that we use to fit light curves, which is based on taking a bunch of spectra and mapping them onto filter space. I don't think anyone has a hard and fast answer. There are some filters that are more useful than others, depending on what range you're looking at. I would say, Obviously, you have to have more than one. Otherwise, you cannot type it, and it's very, basically, you, you definitely need more than one. But one of the things that we're investigating with the observing strategy is which are the most important filters that you need. So the ideal is if you have multiple filters quite close together on the same night, it would be great. Um, but, you, and, I, and I think most people would say, OK, three, three to four filters is sufficient. How about four to four that we're doing filters of, of that really universe? Sorry? How about 40 filters? Four zero. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, then, then you're doing so much better, right? Because then you're very close to getting a spectrum. Right. And, um, yeah, you, I would say for supernova, you don't need to go to that limit. I think you, could, you can do, I'll show you that you can do well enough with only four filters. But um, for something like photometric redshifts, for example, yeah. that would be huge. Yeah, that would just uh, so to, to rebound on that. Um, so, what are the errors that you would have on the redshift? Because so are, for LSST, I suppose that the redshifts are going to be measured using photo uh, photo Z. Yeah. yeah. So the, the redshift thing is very interesting, and actually I'll get back to it at the end. Obviously, for cosmology, we need the redshifts of the supernova, otherwise we can't do anything. So um, the one thing is that it's much easier to get the host galaxy redshift than to get the supernova redshift. Because for supernova, you have a time limit, right? You've got maybe 10, 20 days before it's too faint to do spectroscopy. So to get the supernova spectrum is much harder than to get the first galaxy. 
What we can always do is be like, well, we've measured these 10,000 supernovae, these, these are the galaxies, you can do a dedicated um, follow-up with fibers on all the galaxies. It's a lot easier to get spectroscopic redshifts. That being said, I do think the assumption in LSST is that most of the redshifts will be photometric, which is bad, because there's, there's big error about photometric redshifts. And again, this is, you know, you can talk to me afterwards, I did some work in my PhD, and I uh, will be doing some work in the future on how do we deal with that? You know, how, do we do, how do we deal with these catastrophic outliers, these big distributions over redshifts? And I think that you can get away with it, because we've got big numbers, if you fold the errors correctly into your cosmology. All right, so in order to uh, test our great, amazing classification machine that we're building, we need some data. And the problem is that we need some data that we know the answers to, right? So in the beginning, just to test it, we've just used simulations. So this is simulated uh, DES, that's Dark Energy Survey data. These are already quite old, this is from 2010, but it's a nice data set, public data set lots of people have used. And uh, there's about 20,000 supernova in here, over quite a big redshift range. And uh, so it's a very nice big data set, more, much closer to LSST than any actual data that we have now. The one thing I want to point out, and I'll come back to you right at the very end, is that the training set for this sample is biased. So that is because the training set is trying to emulate how we have done spectroscopic follow-up up till now which is you only follow up the brightest objects because they're easy, they don't take very much telescope time, and so what you get is that you, you don't get anything that's <coughs> fainter, so that biases you in redshift and it biases you in type as well. And this is a real problem, and I will come back to this right at the very end. Okay, so we've got some data. Now, uh, can I just do a quick poll? How many people have heard of machine learning? Okay, cool, basically everyone. So, uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, we've seen this massive rise of the machine recently, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, everyone's using it everywhere, everyone's excited about it. Uh, machines seem to be able to do amazing things these days. And it's starting to creep into astronomy and cosmology as well. So, uh, if you're interested in machine learning, you're thinking about applying it to some problem, this is my personal breakdown of how you approach a supervised learning problem. That's where you have labeled, uh, labeled data. So, to demystify it, machine learning is nothing very special. All it is is a mapping. It's a mapping from some input to some output. And the different machine learning algorithms that there are um, basically just are different descriptions of how you do that mapping. They all have parameters that you have to learn through some training, but really all it is is just mapping A to B. And I'll show you a couple of examples of machine learning algorithms so you can get a feel for how they work. But the idea is that you have data, it's very rare that you can just give raw data to uh, some machine learning algorithm and hope that it works. Uh, so what you usually have to do is extract some kind of features from it, something useful that you think the machine learning algorithm can use to separate classes. Do some machine learning, end up with classified objects. It's basically what you're So the feature selection bit is actually the bit that's hard. I think this bit is really quite easy. There's a lot of tools out there. It's really not that hard to do. There's some caveats, things you have to know. It's not that hard to do machine learning. Feature selection, on the other hand, is actually very hard. This is where you can fall down completely. You give your algorithm bad features, it won't classify anything. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, given these light curves and different filters, how do we extract features that a machine learning algorithm can understand? So the first obvious one is to do what's the industry standard. Uh, which is template fitting, and I'll go through this uh, a bit later, but basically these are models built on empirical data. So we know what supernova look like, we can build a model for a 1A, and use those parameters as features. So this uses a lot of prior knowledge about supernova. The other thing you can try is to be a little more agnostic, and say, well, say all we know about supernova is they go up, they have a bit of a flat bit, they come down. I can write down an equation that describes this general shape, fit those parameters, and use those as features. Or you can be totally agnostic and do a wavelet decomposition. I'll go through wavelets briefly uh, in case you don't know what they are. If you do a wavelet decomposition, this assumes no knowledge whatsoever about supernova. It just assumes you have a signal in time. So you can see this kind of arrow of model independence, 
and uh, we wanted to see how much could you get away with not using prior knowledge about type 1A. So another piece of the puzzle is how to visualize these features, because the problem is, especially with these two, this is a roughly 20 features. So this is a 20 dimensional parameter space. And we know that this is kind of impossible to visualize, right? So this is actually quite a nifty tool. Uh, you could probably use it in your own work if you're ever dealing with high dimensional parameter spaces you're trying to visualize. I'm not gonna go through at all how it works. It's got the very easy rolls of the tongue name of T distributed stochastic neighboring embedding. Or TSME, <laughs> much easier to remember. And what it does basically is it takes this high dimensional space and embeds it in the low dimensional space, preserving the closeness of points. So any points that are close together in this high dimensional space, it tries to place nearby in the two dimensional space. It is stochastic, so every time you run it, you'll get a slightly different plot but the clustering will remain the same. And so what you can see is, if I do a TSME plot of a bunch of features, this is for a, a very standard uh, data set we use in machine learning, and I color them by class, I can immediately tell how well separated the classes are. And I can immediately see, okay, I might struggle to distinguish between these two, but this one I'm gonna have no problem with. So this is a very nice way of visualizing your features, but I will just add a caveat, it's just a visualization. I don't know how well you're doing until you run the machine learning. Speaking of machine learning itself, uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm not going to go through all of these algorithms. We picked five. There are literally hundreds of different algorithms you could choose. But these five are fairly representative of the different kinds of things that you can do. And I've arranged them here sort of in order of uh, complexity. So this is a very, very simple algorithm. And uh, these ones are really quite complex, quite advanced, and they work better on, on more difficult data sets. Now, like I said, I don't want to go through each of these in turn, but I thought I might give you a sort of flavor for how these different algorithms work. So you have, like I said, some sets of features, and this is your, your training set where you know the labels, and from your training set you've got to learn a mapping that's going to allow you to classify everything new. And uh, so what we basically want to do is, for whatever algorithm we use, is draw boundaries around these different classes. That's basically what the algorithm is ending up So I'm going to give two examples. I'm going to talk about k-nearest neighbors and artificial neural networks. K-nearest neighbors you might have heard of. It's a very standard clustering algorithm. And it's very simple. It's one of the simplest algorithms you can do. Say I've got two classes, stars and squares. And now I have, sorry, this is in some feature space. And now I have a new object that I want to classify. So that's the black dot. The simplest form of k-nearest neighbors just says, find the k-nearest neighbors, so say five, do a majority vote, and that's the class it belongs to. It's very simple, and now you can imagine for something very nicely clustered like this, it will actually work relatively well. So what's the distance? What's the, what corresponds to distance? It will be a distance in, in some feature space. So your, your features are all continuous variables. And so you can just do a Euclidean distance so it's a to each point. It's a metric space. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and you can do more advanced things like weighting by distance, etc. You can work out probabilities by doing a normalized number of votes. But it's really a very simple algorithm. You can immediately see how it's going to struggle in high dimensions because now you have to compute distances in very high dimensions, especially if you have a large number of objects. But for simple cases, it actually works very well. Wait, but how does it stop? Sorry? How does it start? How does it start? Yeah, because here you rely on the, on the neighbors already, which you already classified. Yeah. So. yeah, so in all of these algorithms, I'm assuming you have a super, it's a supervised algorithm, which means that you have a training set. So you have some subset of objects for which you know the labels. In our case, it would be the spectroscopic data, so where we had done some follow-up. And it doesn't have to be a big training set, as I'll show you. You can actually get away with a very small one. And then uh, the other algorithm I wanted to point out is artificial neural networks, because probably you've heard of this. Okay, this is Skynet, Terminator, End of the World. So neural networks are the oldest uh, machine learning algorithm. These are something like 50 years old. Um, and they've recently received this kind of resurgence of popularity thanks to Google and uh, this concept called deep learning. So deep learning is basically just neural networks that are very, very deep, they have many layers. 
And these can do amazing things. So these have cracked image recognition problems. Uh, now we have computers that can beat humans at Go, which was you know, thought to never be possible. Uh, they can lip read better than humans can. It's quite, uh, quite amazing what these algorithms can actually do. So neural networks, again, like any machine learning algorithm or a mapping, you have some inputs, but it learns the mapping to some outputs. They're based on what we think, how they think the human brain works. It's probably not, but you know, it's sure it's not. Where you have a layer of these nodes called neurons connected to each of these inputs. And what you do is you learn the weights on each of these neurons from your training. And there's some nonlinear activation function that's pointed up here in between the different layers. So what this means is you can actually write down a neural network. Once you train a neural network, you can write down the equation. It'll probably be a page long, but you can write it down. And it'll have weights, which are your parameters. And the key point is that it's nonlinear. And because it can do this highly complex nonlinear mapping from inputs to outputs, you can actually fit very complicated data with this uh, equally complicated model. So this is why they're very powerful, they're very flexible, is this inherent nonlinearity. Okay. The last piece of the puzzle before I show you some results is how we actually compare machine learning algorithms. Now, you might say, well, I know when a machine learning algorithm is doing well, I can just look at the accuracy. Right? How many 1As did it classify correctly out of the total number of 1As in my sample? The problem with that is, if that's your metric, then any machine learning algorithm will just say, all right, I'll just classify everything as 1As. I'll get 100% accuracy. But now you have all these false positives. So you see there's always going to be this playoff between purity and something called recall, how many objects we manage to keep. So rock curves uh, allow you to actually, um, allow you to look at both cases, allow you to look at purity and efficiency. These things are called receiver operator characteristic curves. As far as I can tell, the name has nothing to do with the block at all. I have no idea. Well, I, I have a little bit of it. It comes from World War II. Some radar operators invented this thing in a fairly different form. But anyway, the name stuck. They're called rock curves. And they look a little bit complicated, but they're actually uh, very, very useful tools. So I'll switch to this one. We have on the x-axis is false positive rates, which you can think of like contamination. So at this end is you have very high contamination, lots of non-1As in your sample. And here we have true positive rate, which is completeness. So you can immediately see the right point to be is up here. 100% complete, 0% contaminated. Then you have perfect classification. How do you get these lines? Well, remember right at the beginning I said that we want to get a probability of an object belonging to any particular class. So I can say, I'm 83% sure this object is a 1A. Now the question I ask for you is, if you're 83% sure, should you include it in your sample from which you do cosmology? Now, as cosmologists, we might be like, well, actually, that's a bit low. Actually, I think I want to be 95% sure, because too much contamination causes biases. We know that that's very dangerous. Whereas maybe you're studying core collapse supernovae and their correlation with host galaxies, maybe you don't care so much, maybe you want a bigger sample, you might set that threshold much lower. Say, OK, we only want to be 60%. So you see, depending on your problem and how you want to use your final classified sample, you might change your threshold. And that's how you get these lines. Over here, I put a very strict threshold so that I've got very low contamination, but I've also got very low completeness. Whereas over here, I'm accepting basically everything. And you can immediately see that the best algorithms have lines like this dark one, getting as close as possible to that corner. This is random. Any algorithm here isn't doing any better than random. If it's doing worse than random, something's very wrong. <laughs> and you can summarize this in one number if you want with this area under the curve, which you want as close to one as possible. And this is how you can compare different algorithms across different situations. Okay. So basically, to summarize what we've done so far before I show you the final results, I spent most of my two years First off, well not most, but a good chunk of material first off writing thousands of lines of code to do this. And this is basically a snapshot of what the pipeline looks like. You can take some data, you can choose to decompose it and get features using one of the different feature methods that I mentioned. 
this being very dependent on super, um, knowledge of supernova, this being independent. You can run them through all five different machine learning algorithms, and it's very easy to add more. It's very extendable software. And you end up with your classified supernova. You can make rock curves. So this is a snapshot of what the whole pipeline does. And the reason we didn't just pick one algorithm as being the best and one feature set as being the best is because we only have one data set to test them on. Now we're testing it on SPSS data, now we're going to look at DES data, now we're going to look at LSSD simulations with different observing strategies. We don't know what's going to turn out to be best. So we've included everything in this pipeline. You can run all of it. Okay, just before I talk about results, is there any questions at this point? Why? The supernova that went into here, 
are the same supernova that went into the simulations. There's a library of templates of non-1As and 1As that's used for simulations. <coughs> and nobody's updated that library in quite a long time. So we're not really that surprised that this particular method works well. So, it, But it's good to see that it does. The next thing we tried was doing this parameterization. So you have an equation. We've got two different equations. Ooh, that didn't come up all that well. Anyway, we've got two different equations that uh, just model the shape of the light curve. Uh, this one is used quite a lot in, um, model two is used a lot actually in supernova, in these kinds of studies in supernova photometry. Um, so the idea is that you fit this model to each of your filters. So you end up with quite a lot of parameters. In this case, it's 20, in this case, 25, 24. The TSNE plots look terrible. This is model one. It doesn't look like any separation. I was like, it's not going to work. It sort of does work. It's actually OK. This is a bit misleading. It's actually OK. Uh, but the number is definitely lower than for a SOL2. So it's a one. I want to just do a quick aside as to why rock curves are cool. If you look at the, forget the other lines exist, and just look at the green and the blue. This is May, Bays, and Kenya's neighbors. You can see the AUC is almost identical. But now you see how they cross over here. So if you're, if you are demanding very, very high purity, then you'd probably go for the blue one. You go for May, Bays. Because you get more completeness for the same level of contamination. But if you didn't care that much, you wanted as big a sample as possible, then you would actually go probably over here, because you would get, again, more completeness for the same level of contamination. You'd go for Canary Snapers. So the prop curve is nice to show these different algorithms in different circumstances, but ultimately, boosted decision trees means everything. So you should just use that. I found the same with model two. And we get even worse, uh, we really get much worse uh, fits for model 2. So this model that's used a lot in supernova cosmology, or the supernova in general, doesn't seem to be very good at distinguishing between classes. Interesting. Michelle, do you yes. marginalize over the metallicity of the projector galaxy? Of the host galaxy? Yeah, host. Yeah, there's no information about host galaxies here. But uh, this, is, this is a very obvious extension, because we know that there are correlations between supernova type and host galaxy, right? right? Um, so that's also some, another step that we want to do, because for SDSS, we actually have some information on morphology, metallicity, all kinds of parameters yeah. of host galaxy. So you can only assume that these results would only get better if you have host galaxy information. The last one that we tried is this wave listing. Now, this is a little bit complicated, uh, so I'm not but it's great. Uh, if, you, if you really want all the details, read the paper. But um, if you don't know what wavelets are, wavelets are really cool. They're kind of, if you think about a Fourier transform, say I have some signal here. Say the signal is very high frequency at this part of the time. I don't know what, okay. <laughs> I just have to use my hands. So you have a very high frequency here, then a low frequency, but then a high frequency. But if I do an FFT of that, I'm going to get a few spikes in frequency, but I'm not going to have any information about where in that signal, spatially, those frequencies occur. So wavelets are really cool. They're, they're this kind of uh, in between your signal space and your Fourier space. They allow you to uh, learn both spatial information and frequency information. So these are incredibly useful in signal processing. They use all the time. And um, ultimately, all it is is just applying a band pass filter to your signal. And these are generally very, very useful ways of decomposing signals. And that's how we use them here. So for example, there's a family of wavelets. Don't worry too much about the actual family we use. What you have to do is you have to interpolate the light curve in some ways, because these are all measured at different points. So for interpolation, we decided to use Gaussian processes. Very nice, unbiased way of doing interpolation. You do a wavelet decomposition, so you get a bunch of coefficients for all your wavelets. Now you end up with hundreds of features, way too big for machine learning. Many of these are redundant. So what you can do is just do a PCA, or there's more intelligent things you can do, but for now we just do a PCA. And you end up with roughly 20 features. And just to point out that you can reverse the whole process and get back your very well-fitting light, just with these 20 features. 
So I, like I said, just go through the paper if you're very interested in details. Um, the cool thing is that when you use these coefficients as your features, the TCD plots look great. So you can see that the type twos are, you know, a little bit more, quite a bit more separated than the green ones. There are regions of very pure 1A space. So it's looking quite good. And indeed, when you run it through the machine learning, we get very, no, I'll explain this in a second. We get really good results. So this is very similar to what we were getting from the SALT2. Now that's really cool, because like I said, the same supernova that go into SALT2 went into the simulations. But the wavelets don't know anything about those supernovae. This is a completely agnostic approach. And we can still get the same results. So that means we have a cross-check. You can run both different feature extraction methods, and you have a cross-check for any new supernova data. Why does naive base suck so much? Um, this is because this algorithm has a lot of very strong assumptions in it, very simple algorithm. It assumes features are independent, which they're usually not. It assumes features are Gaussian distributed, and in this case, they're not at all. Uh, so it fails completely. But that's OK, because my favorite algorithm does better. OK, so I'm almost done. Uh, I just want to like, basically show you the money plot. So these last two plots are really key points in the paper. There's quite a lot going on in them, but uh, this, is, this was really the key result. So the first question is, we had a look at non-representative versus representative training set. Now remember I said that the training set supplied with the simulated data is um, non-representative because only bright objects were followed up. This means you're going to bias yourself, you're going to have more 1As than non-1As because they're intrinsically brighter and you're going to have low, only low redshift objects. Now, we also had a look at, because we had the simulations, we have all the answers, we took a random subsample, the same size as what was supplied, and used that as a training set, which was representative in every way. And we compared the two results. So what are you looking at here? On the x-axis, I've got algorithms sort of arranged in order of general awesomeness. Um, so these are the really simple ones, and these are the more advanced ones. Here I've got AEC, you remember you want it to be as close to one as possible. In the different colors, I've got my four different feature extraction methods. And uh, in the solid and dotted lines, I'm comparing representative versus non-representative. First thing you should notice, the SALT2 and the wavelets feature sets do very well. And they beat the uh, parametric fits. So it seems like either you want to use as much information as you can, or be completely agnostic using the wavelets, this kind of in-between approach doesn't really work. It doesn't work well in distinguishing classes. The next thing you'll notice is that, indeed, the user decision trees consistently do better than most of the other algorithms. So we wouldn't even consider using these more simplistic algorithms. And then the third thing you notice is that, especially if you look here in this regime, you have a huge effect of re on representativeness. Representativeness has a huge effect on these results. So um, our take-home message to Alex's team when we went to the conference and presented these results, we said we need as representative a follow-up program as possible. It doesn't matter if it means we get less supernova. I'd rather have less supernova and be more representative. Because this is only 5% of the total data set used as training, and we can do really well. So that was the really key point. Representativeness matters. It's very similar plot. Now we're comparing redshift and no redshift. So this is when I've used included redshift as a feature versus withholding it. Now this is the photometric host galaxy redshift in the simulations. And uh, if you look specifically with SALT2 and specifically with KNOS neighbors, which I just want to point out somewhat facetiously that this is what SDSS currently does. They use SALT2 with KNOS neighbors. There's a huge impact on whether or not you include the redshift. But if you use a more advanced algorithm, it basically doesn't care. You can get away, you can do classification without any redshift information whatsoever. You can turn that around to say, well, there's redshift information in the feature sets. And essentially, it's learning that. That's why it doesn't need any additional redshift information. This doesn't help you that much, because of course you need redshift for like I said, but it means that any errors you make in classification are completely uncorrelated with errors you make in redshift. So that's quite nice. 
So the nice thing is that you have these two, the soft term weightless are a very independent way of doing classification, and you don't need redshift for either of them, which is great. So these are my conclusions. Uh, hopefully you're super excited about supernova cosmology, you're super excited about LSST, you can test all your great theories, um, and you're also convinced that contamination is a problem. So we've got these three very general approaches to feature selection, uh, they're all very promising, and even the worst ones perform quite well. And we looked at several machine learning algorithms and there are very obvious advantages to using the more advanced ones. And the key point is that we need a representative training set or none of this is going to work. And also that we can get away without any range of information. And now, of course, the next step is to apply this to real data. So we're busy working on a paper now. We're applying it to SDSS and finding very similar results, which is very encouraging. And uh, possibly applying to DES and further LSST simulations. And again, the eventual idea is to have a look at the effect of observing strategy on classification. So I'll leave you with a few references and please feel free to email me if you have any uh, further questions or comments. Thank you very much. I have one and a half questions. Can I give you half an answer? <laughs> one and a half. So first is, do you think there's any science we can do by seeing or watching how the or fixing parameters change as a function of the contamination we tolerate? And if so, has it more to do with cosmology or astrophysics? In your opinion? So, are you, are you talking about the cosmological parameters? If you add more right. contamination, what happens to the yes. cosmological parameters? Um, so, I think, okay, so in my PhD, I worked on an algorithm called Beams, Bayesian estimation of to multiple species, where we looked at this exact problem just in a different way. And we said, how do we do cosmology knowing that we have contamination? And what you have to do is you have to basically model the contamination population, so model the nominates. And then it turns out that you can actually get our unbiased cosmological parameters. I think it's very, it's a little bit dangerous to think about it the way that, that you're suggesting, um, because we don't have a ground truth, really. You know, we can see how the, the parameters change, but we already know how they're going to change. Because we know that non-1As are always fainter than 1As. We've observed this. Um, so they're always going to pull the, pram pull the Hubble diagram off in the same way. And what's going on there is not cosmology. We know it's not cosmology. It's just astrophysics. It's just because these are not good standard candles. So um, I think the right way to treat it is to model that population and be able to, to estimate the cosmological parameters in an unbiased way. But there is interesting things to be learned about um, understanding that contaminant population from an astrophysics point of view, understanding the, the core collapse, they get a bit neglected, I think. So we don't know that much about them. Can coincidences with gravitational waves help the investigation? Um, I don't know. That's a very interesting question. So who would expect the gravitational wave signature? This two classes would be completely different. Yeah, you would expect, well, I don't know about completely different, but I, mean, I think you would definitely expect One is expect collapsed and the other one is a coalescence, yeah. probably, yeah. no? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not enough of an expert on gravitational waves to be able to answer that co you know, coherently. Uh, I, think it would be, I think it would be very interesting, and I think, you know, these multi-messenger studies, um, it's probably more interesting in terms of understanding the astrophysics of what's going on. Now that you have information from the gravitational wave directly probing what's happening at the point of collapse. Um, so I think that must be an amazing source of information for people trying to understand astrophysics. I think uh, for classification, I mean, first of all, we're just nowhere near at that point, right? We're going to get to the 100,000 supernova mark long before we're going to have so many gravitational waves, we'll have gravitational waves for each of them. So I think it's probably more an interesting physics question than, a, you know, this is a tool, really. It's so too early. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Mm -hmm. Have you tried using genetic algorithms as a machine learning mm. process? They're extremely efficient, similar to the wavelength. The only thing is that it's adaptive. Mm. So you, you make mutations, and you put a selection mechanism, and it very quickly, it's mm. extremely robust and mm. efficient. Yeah, so I, I, haven't, I haven't personally used uh, genetic algorithms here. Um, it's, it's certainly something worth 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.